Thanks for listening to Performance Anxiety. This week's guest is Chris Maxwell. He's lived more musical lives than most. Starting off on a guitar with no strings, he moved on to the pop band The Gun Bunnies. Then he moved to New York City and got a job booking acts for the famous club The Knitting Factory. From there, he joined the alternative scene with the band Skeleton Key. After one critically acclaimed album, he moved on to the world of TV music, recording themes for Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations and Bob's Burgers, among others. He's back to writing music for himself and has a new album out soon, but he's not your typical singer-songwriter. So check out New Store Number 2. Follow Goat House Studios on social media. Follow us at Performance ANX. Subscribe, rate, review, share, and get a load of Chris Maxwell. Hello, this is uh, Chris Maxwell, and um, you're listening to uh, Mark Shea and Performance Anxiety. Uh, Pick up my new record, new store number two on Max Recordings. What do you say after that? Tell me where you are again. I am in Virginia, in Winchester, Virginia. So I'm about oh. 75 miles due west of D.C. Oh, okay. All right. Home of Patsy Cline. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I had a revelation I wanted to move back to the south today. I, I, I live, you know, living in Woodside. I'm from Arkansas originally. Yeah. And uh, I was um, listening to The Bitter Southerner, which is a, uh, do you know that podcast? No. It's, He's a really interesting um, um, Southern podcast, uh, po- not just podcast. He also does a magazine and okay, um, uh, interesting. But I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I, I like the South. Yeah, I lived in Alabama for ten years. My wife was you know lived there her entire life until we moved up here, and uh, all three of my kids were born down there. So it's uh, it's I you know it's got for me it's got its great good points and bad points. I, I lived in New Jersey for, you know, 13 years, went to college in Rochester, lived in Virginia, you know, part, part of my child was, was in Virginia, so born in Texas, so I was just been all over the place, and I've always liked the, how far south Virginia is, but how it also has a little bit of the north in it, so. Right, yeah, I lived in Waynesboro for a summer, my, um, um, my, my my dad lived in in uh, my mom and my dad separate, got divorced when I was uh, like basically when I was born. So oh, wow. I I <clears throat> ended up spending one summer with him in Waynesboro, uh, which I think is not too far from Richmond. I think um, you're right. Yeah, it's it's um, I think it's more southern part of Virginia. Uh, yeah, from, right. Not totally sure, but. Uh, yeah, you know, and we, I, I spent three months there and, um, uh, didn't, you know, I was really young. I don't have much memory of it, but yeah, yeah Virginia's, Virginia's interesting because it's got so much history and it's, there's a two different sections of Virginia. There's Northern Virginia, which is like Fairfax, Loudoun County, um, Arlington, just out, just outside of DC. And then. There's yeah, everything else, and it's 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 funny because it's like northern Northern Virginia is where everybody who works in D.C. lives because that's the only people that can afford to live there. And then Northern Virginia, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Loudon is like one one, if not the wealthiest county in the country, or something. It's, it's insane, and it everything else is completely. Different people, people from the rest of the state don't trust those people because a lot of them are transient. You know, they they, they come in for whatever right. administration is in or, you know, whatever temporary uh, government contract job they've got. And then in, you know, four to eight, ten years, they're gone. So right. Yeah. It's an interesting it, spot. Yeah, that that is interesting, especially in these times. Uh, the the level of trust on, on our government is at an all time low. So, oh. um, yeah, if your neighbor is, uh, is, uh, is a politician, you're probably oh. not super psyched about that. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> oh God, excuse me. Sorry about that. You got a cold? A little bit of one. Yeah. I'm just uh, trying to fight it off. So 
What you drinking there? Uh, makers and some bitters. That's what I could use right now to knock out this chest congestion I've got. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a healthy drink. Oh, I've got if you um, I'll tell you what, if you like that, I'm doing a, an episode here real soon, and if you look down at all on the recent guests I've had, you'll see uh, Chef Selena Tio. Yeah, she, she was on the, uh, one of the finalists for uh, let's see, it was Top Chef Masters and Iron Chef America. And oh. she's got a, a restaurant, a couple of restaurants in Kansas City, and her bar has got 350 different types of whiskey. 250 of them are bourbon. So, wow. So, yeah, she's coming back on in a couple of weeks, and, and uh, I gave her a list of, of music, and she's picking some of her own favorites. I'm picking some of mine. Got some suggestions from some prior guests and all. She's matching about 15 songs to different bourbons. Wow. So that's going to be fun. fun. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so... Yeah. But I'm anxious for that one. So, if you're a fan of whiskey, bourbon in particular, that one will be fun. Yeah, so. I, yeah and, I, and I am. So, yeah, that's <laughs> good to know. So, thank you again for coming on. I really do appreciate it. It's uh, I've been listening to the new album, uh, New Story oh, Number 2, and I was comparing it to uh, a skeleton key. Oh right, and it's just, it, it's 180 degrees. It's it's crazy, and I, I will definitely want to learn more about how you did that transition. But I want to learn more about how you got into music in the first place. So you're, yeah, you're from Arkansas. Yeah. When did you start getting into music? Was it, was were your parents? Your and you said you, earlier that your parents divorced when you were really young. Did your was your mom playing a lot of music in the house? Um, yeah, we definitely had music in the house and, um, uh, you know, it's funny cause I was reflecting on, uh, on some, on some music, uh, uh, today, uh, on, on, um, I was working on another, on another project, um, and, and doing some writing about, uh, my experience with vinyl and, and, uh, one of the things that, you know, came up in my memory was, some of the records that if you're if you're of my generation you know you your first experience with music is going to probably be your parents records that they have playing around and and um and so you know you know fortunately they had my mom was a real young mother and so my music the music i grew up with was what was uh she was 19 when she had me in 64 so there was there you know we were listening to you know the beatles right off the bat and then right. uh she was into you know joni mitchell records and sonny rollins records and oh, wow um you know we uh, w- there wasn't a lot of jazz but there was some ella and live in berlin and and some of those records and so yeah that was my initial sort of um excitement around around you know music i i but i I don't think i was any different than anybody else at that point you know in terms of just like enjoying music you just there wasn't a lot to do so you know one of the things you did was you know put a record on or in some time in some cases an eight track yeah. cassette, <laughs> which uh which was also um a part of my you know experience growing up too but um we weren't heavily music oriented as a family so uh other than just you know and listening and um at some point i think i just discovered the guitar and around like 11 or 12 years old and and i you know for whatever reason i just dove into that really hard yeah well it's it's a great instrument to do that with especially growing up around that time you know you, you grew up around the the beatles you got george harrison you know jimmy page is around that time jeff beck all the you know all those guys coming yeah. up in, in their first band the yardbirds and all I mean, they changed the, the face of music. So, and I, well, I, the the thing that I I actually the, my 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 transformation moment is 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 it's it's kind of funny because we were a member of the Columbia House Music Club. <laughs> um, so you know you you get 
you like what for a penny you get you know yeah, you get like 12 I can't albums what the, what, I, I can't remember what the how that worked but it was something ridiculous like for a penny you get you know like a, a year's worth of records or something crazy i can't remember what it was yeah and um so they would send you a they would send you an eight track cassette a month one one a month and you could choose it or if you didn't choose it and you're a part of the of that club then they would just send you whatever they decided they would send you yeah the, the album of the month or something album of the month so uh, i was it's probably like 1970 i think 77 78 something like that and i we had just gotten peter frampton the frampton comes alive oh wow and uh, I, I remember they put the they put that eight track cassette in, and, and I was you know I don't know I was probably ten years old, eleven years old, and I was like, what is everybody cheering about? What is all the <laughs> what are all these people yelling about? And then my mom was like, because Peter Frampton's just playing guitar, and they they're so into it, and I was like. Well, shit, man! I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, "God damn, that sounds like fun!" And so, yeah. <laughs> so she, 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 we weren't so well off at that point. So she, had, she had a guitar, but this sounds ridiculous, and I, and I, I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's honest to god truth. She didn't have a. She, she the only guitar she had was that. that that she owned was a broken acoustic that had no strings on it. And she said, well, this is, you know, well, here's a guitar. Uh, it doesn't have any strings on it, but you know, it, you know, you can mess around with it. Okay. So, so I, what I did was I learned where all the notes were on the guitar. If it had had strings on it. And then, uh, wow. she, and it, it, I'll, I'll, the not, not, not all uh, in the first position. So right. I learned where I was like, here's where all the notes are in the first position. You know, how about getting me a, a guitar now with strings on it? So, so that was the, uh, th I, I passed the first, it was like a, like a, M a Miyagi kind of a wash on, wash off. Yeah. Situation. <laughs> I've done the theory without the actual strings. So yeah, now let's 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 get some actual playing in here. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Anyway, oh so it, worked. It, it it ended up working out. They, they they got me a guitar, and and then I was off and running. Wow. I I have never heard anything any remotely <laughs> like that story before. <laughs> so when did you start playing with other people? Uh, play? Did you? Uh, I mean, were you playing throughout school? Or did you? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. Pretty quickly, I, I had a, a really fast ramp up. I, 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 I was one of those guys, you know, that, you know, you, you hear guitar players talk about, you know, you know, practicing whatever, eight hours a day or whatever. And I, right. I was one of those guys. So like, you know, uh, you know, I'd come home from school at four o'clock and then basically, you know, I would just go until, you know, you know, until I had to go to bed at night and, and. So within the first year of of learning guitar, uh, this also sounds completely ridiculous and and unbelievable. But I started teaching at the guitar store that I had was taking lessons from. I walked into the store one day after school, and the owner of the store said, uh, "Your teacher Danny has left uh, just kind of unexpectedly, but he seems to think you're." good enough at this point to go ahead and take over all of his students wow so, <laughs> which let me make that let me make let me let me make it this clear i was not that was that was not the truth <laughs> these te but, these students had strings on their guitars <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, everybody had strings and uh it, it was really uh it was kind of funny but i ended up teaching there for the next like until i was out of high school. So I went from the time I taught there from, I was like 12, 13 years old, actually 13 until I was out until I was out of high school, uh, at, at this music store. Um, and, um, yeah, I, so, but I, I was in bands right off the bat pretty quickly. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, I was, you know, it's uh, Southwest Little Rock where I grew up was, uh, is, um, was, um, uh, 
it was a lot of a lot of pickup trucks, a lot of uh, gun racks in the window. Um, yeah. You know, you you it's it was a it, you know I I love it and and I I, I loved I loved where I grew up um, and I love the people I grew up with. Um, the culture is something unto itself like it's it's you know living in the northeast now it's it's sometimes i feel like i'm in a foreign country compared to where i grew up but yeah i know exactly what you're talking about yeah it's <laughs> it's it, it was an interesting place and there were a lot of challenges in terms of uh, culturally there that uh, i was aware of even as a young kid you know like you know dealing with racism and and um, a lot of the things that you know in the Bible Belt, the things that you have to deal with. But, right. um, but uh, you know, I, I got a band together, and you know, we we learned a bunch of Leonard Skinner songs, and we're right. off and running. There you go. Now, <laughs> now being in Arkansas, I don't know, you don't know if you if, if they like you playing uh, Sweet Home Alabama. They love anything like that. <laughs> yeah, like, are you kidding? Uh, no. Uh, and uh, as long as you play it good, you know you you, yeah. know, you really you don't want to you don't want to screw uh, screw that up. As long as you don't uh, play it during the uh, Arkansas Alabama game, you're okay. No, no, then you're okay. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so was singing always part of it for you? Did you start was that right off the bat? You were singing and playing guitar. Um. Yeah, I was I, I early on, you know, struggling with that, trying to figure it out. Um, you know, the singing for me was has always been a, um, you know, I'm a, I, I like to, you know, say, a, you know, as a singer, I'm a stylist. You know, I, I, <laughs> I do what I do, and I, I, I try to get the hit the right notes, and you know, uh, but you, you're not, I'm not, nobody's going on, uh, you know, any kind of a talent show. Uh, with my voice, but you're not going to be the uh, next the masked singer. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> not going to happen. But you know, uh, growing up and hearing people sing uh, all different kinds of things, I realized you know the content was could trump the the vocal aspect of it. You know, and the, the honesty you convey and whatever you're trying to do through your voice, as long as um, as long as there's something going on there. Uh, uh, then you know you can you know you can have a you can have a, a very interesting voice and get away with it. Well, I definitely want to to I've got some thoughts on that, but I want to do, touch on that later because I still want to find out some more about you because you end up in Memphis working with uh, Jim Dickinson, yeah, Big Star, Rolling Stones. I mean, how did yeah. you how did you end up getting hooked up with with Jim? Uh, Jim was a um, was, is also a Little Rock native. Um, um, and he, uh, um, that wasn't really the connection. I mean, uh, the little rock thing was really more of a coincidence, but, um, it might've helped at some point in making a connection with him. Cause I think he probably had a soft spot for anybody from little rock, but, um, uh, he was, um, um, uh, we had gotten, my band, the Gun Bunnies, at that time, which was in the late '80s, had uh, kind of moved through the ranks. Um, we played South by Southwest when probably the first or second South by Southwest there wow. ever was, and played it probably for the next five or six years after that. And um, and I it was at that point I, I had two bands playing South by Southwest. I, you could you could anybody could get in if you were if you had a good band you could get into South by Southwest. There was no industry the way that it, the, the, the kind of industry that it is today. Right. It was really a bunch of bands getting uh, getting invited to play, submitting a tape, them reviewing it, and then uh, it was a real honest to God music festival for, you know, for a bunch of upstarts. Okay. And yeah. And I literally got signed at South by Southwest, um, wow. which I don't even know if bands that even happens now at this point. I think it's, it's more like, um, you're 
premiering your your yeah. album. Or, it's Lady Gaga is playing South by Southwest, but yeah, it's very ridiculous. Uh, at the day, <laughs> in the day that I did it, you know, you know, it was uh, uh, that was the kind of thing. But we would got we kind of moved to the next level, um, and um, we, there was a lot of interest in us. And this is before we got signed. And there, my manager at the time, who was based in Memphis, said, you know, who would you want to? produce your band like you know if you had your choice and my choice at that time was i said well either t-bone Burnett or jim dickinson and uh good names yeah good names and 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 even good names even uh uh i mean t-bone's uh t-bone in 1989 was a lot different than T-Bone today. That's a different character completely. Right, right. Not the not the same deal. And in fact, Dickinson, I I chose Dick. I met with the T-Bone people, but the the uh, Dickinson's Big Star Three was and and the replacements pleased to meet me. And also his uh, Toots Toots in Memphis record, um, uh, Green on Red. I mean, there was just there was just a lot of stuff there uh that rang true for me and uh you know it just he just and when we met him it was just like holy shit man this guy is is such a character (laughs) you know i mean as a for a producer you want to you want a producer to be somewhat of like a an insane sherpa you know like uh some (laughs) you know crazy ass shaman guy and and he was definitely that and um yeah i mean in the end i you know that it's a shame because the record itself for that for that that uh never it did not he didn't bring that insanity to that record he yeah that record was a little bit of a disappointment for for all of us we were kind of a rowdy you know post-punk uh you know replacements arkansas version of that that you know kind of a bunch of young guys that were just you know sloppy and and trying to write good songs and i think we did write good songs but you know there was the execution was definitely um um spirited you know it was uh and we didn't really capture that. We captured some kind of other. Uh, I think Jim wanted to try to make a record that that was successful for him, and and uh, uh, yeah. and I think he thought my songs might have done that, and he, he ended up kind of like uh, castrating the whole process. But uh, but I, okay. I learned a lot from him. He was a, he's an ins- you know, amazing guy, and I, I, I the stories that I I you know that I uh, <laughs> they told us. You know, the experience of working with Jim was, I'll never regret that. It was an amazing experience. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the guy's legendary. So, yeah. So how long were you in Memphis before you ended up going to New York? I moved to New York in 94, so I was almost okay. 30 before I moved. I mean, I was in the South, you know, for a while, and then moved to New York in 94, and really hit the ground running. I started working at the Knitting Factory um which was uh kind of a dream job for me uh, just booking bands it, it was kind of a uh, an, an amazing way to get up to speed on what was going on in in the northeast and, right. and i you know back then you know you got to remember back then you know it's like you just didn't have the kind of um the the access that you have now to everything you know through the internet it just didn't exist so oh, yeah. you know regional stuff was you know it, it things really gestated in these little areas and so moving to new york was a completely new experience and and i was lucky to uh to land a land a gig there yeah and it's such a and a, you know it's such a location i mean the knitting factory is legendary i'm trying yeah. to yeah, I'm trying to remember who I think I saw either, either Reverend Horton Heat or Juliana Hatfield there. I don't remember which one, but I know I saw somebody there. Yeah, I don't remember exactly who it was. Well, either one of those could have easily have played there for sure. I worked at both uh, the 47 East Houston, which was the original club, and then they moved to Leonard Street in Tribeca, and I moved and I worked there for a little bit too. But yeah, um, yeah, it was a 
that was that was pretty incredible because I met a lot of people. <clears throat> people had to, you know, I I had to deal with people like John Zorn and you know Mark yeah. Repo and uh, you know Diamond Gallas and all. Oh you know, my like, gosh! So many so many incredible people. Um, Diamond, man, that must have been crazy. Yeah, and it was just a great education for me to to come from where I came from and and then suddenly be. And I kind of lied my way into the job. Oh, really? I think I can say that now. And enough, enough years have passed. Michael Dorf is probably okay with that. But <laughs> I just sort of made up the fact that I knew any of who any of these people were, and <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, you know, I think I had one Lounge Lizards record was the, like the only thing I re- kind of basically knew about what was going on in that downtown New York scene. So I I kind of bullshitted my way in there, and then I I had to just do a crash course on it. Oh my gosh! So now at that point, were you still were you playing in bands, or were you looking to be in a band? Well, I moved there with a, with a, with a label deal. My first band had been on Virgin Records, and the the uh, Lorik Weymouth, who was actually Tina Weymouth's brother, had signed us to Virgin, and he had left Virgin and was um, starting an independent label. And I made a record in my bedroom in uh, Arkansas that I moved to New York with in my pocket to to hand over to them wow. to start my new life in New York with this new record, new label, the whole thing. And as soon as I landed there, they were also going to give me a publishing deal, a few thousand bucks to like get started. Wow. And as soon as I landed, they dissolved and there was it didn't exist anymore. Oh. So... so Jeez. I had to scram. Yeah, it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of a, a shock, and I had to. Yeah, I bet. But I, I I had the I had the record in my pocket, and I I handed it out to a bunch of people, and people dug it. You know, just uh, just sort of word of mouth, and um, in in Lower Manhattan, I got a, a few uh, right off the bat. Kind of got a few uh, a little bit of interest, and started playing places like Shanae and. Uh, oh, CB's yeah. gallery and um, and it was probably at uh, you know two two very important gigs for me early really early on in the process was Shanae playing there and uh, Warren Blowdow saw me play um, and he turned me on to, he turned Eric Sanko who was the Lounge Lizards bass player and he was starting a band called Skeleton Key and then that was that's how i got my entree into that okay and um and then uh i played a a fairly important gig for me at that point at cb's gallery um with a bunch of amazing uh knitting factory people that sort of helped get me raise my profile there a little bit and and you know yeah it was i was kind of off and running fairly quickly so when you when you joined and, and started playing with Skeleton Key, how did you guys decide you wanted to play Garbage? That's because you, you had a per, you, you had a drummer, and then you had a percussionist who played things like uh, let me let me look here, um, film reels, uh, yeah. a red wagon, yeah, coffin pans, propane yeah. tanks. Yeah, propane tank. Yeah, the propane tank was tough crossing a border, like crossing the border, like into Canada. Ah. You, you, it's uh, you, you, that was those were that was a tough one, but yeah, that uh, I can't imagine why. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was completely and totally Eric Senko's uh, vision. Um, um, and Skeleton Key itself was really the vision of 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 Eric's, um, and um. He he was uh, he had a really he had a very clear idea of, of what he wanted, and one of the things he wanted was um, this kind of junk percussion as a part of it. And I think that, that was probably you know inspired by you know um, you know Tom Waits and and um, I can't think of the guy's name Michael Blair uh, the the percussionist for for weights you know oh okay yeah who used a lot of junk in his kit that sound of a of like an like an early industrial kind of machine like 
steampunky kind of machine that's okay. just like you know like gears grinding and I, you know it, it was a it was a cool thing what made it cool was is the the, the guy that we found to do it um that that eric found was rick lee who was an is is an insanely gifted musician and and could can play anything and and his approach to playing junk percussion and the way that our drummer Steve Calhoun complimented it was nothing that anybody could have really uh, written out on paper and designed. It, it just when those two guys got into a room and then Eric basically said, "I kind of want you to do this." What they ended up doing was so mind blowing that we just were like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> uh, it was a, it was live. That band was was I think maybe you know it was definitely the the, the most incredible live band I've ever been in, and and the um, uh, it was an exciting, really really exciting band. It was an exciting time too. I mean, you, the the feeling i get from listening go back and listening to skeleton key is almost like a cross between like an einstein neubauten and primus yeah well Primus. we toured with primus in europe and and uh and yeah no about that 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 was definitely that was uh you know talk about playing junk you know when you're yeah. lighting you know 50 gallon drums on fire and, and banging them with a sledgehammer or whatever <laughs> you're you're uh uh, we didn't invent any of that, you know. That was our, that was our, that was already being done. What, what 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 I think we did sort of come up with was was put, figuring out how to make weird pop songs, uh, kind of or, or put that element into these these little three minute pop songs. Uh, that yeah. was a a pretty interesting mix, and I and I and I'm uh, you know I think that was a that was what was so unique about that band. What I like about it a lot is that it. Like, you know, you do have that primacy kind of sound of the music, but vocally, it's, it, I mean, it's, and lyrically, it's, just, it's not as goofy as Primus. Primus was a silly band. And they just are yeah. a silly band. And, and they're, you know, they know they're a silly band. And, and now some of the lyrics are interesting and the song titles are, are pretty wild, but, you know, you, you, there's some effort into, into singing it. You know, I mean, like, you know, songs like, I mean, one of my favorites is Vomit Ascot. That that song is amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the that's the junk percussionist. That's yeah. that's Rick. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a cool band because you know one of the things I, I insisted on because I had something going at that point for myself, and I was the same band, not the junk percussionist, but Steve Calhoun, the drummer, and and Eric played with me in my own solo thing. So I had my own solo band. Yeah. We only, I probably only did two couple of gigs like that, two or three gigs, and then and then we had Skeleton Key. So we had two different things. Skeleton Key took off immediately. It was it, it sort of it was just it was such a cool concept and such a fun thing to see. And I really loved playing guitar. I but one of the one of the caveats was that you know you know we all get to write we all get to you know we all get to be a part of this creative process or i don't want to be a part of it and you know eric was a benevolent you know leader and he um he allowed all that to happen and we got some really cool stuff out of rick and um amazing ideas from from steve the drummer and and um and then i wrote a bunch of songs myself and sang them and you know i had figure out how to make those songs my sort of weird pop mind <laughs> which i was really coming from more like a power pop like who's could do uh sugar you know that kind of world uh, before that you know like the replacements and big star and that yeah. kind of thing 
So I had to try to make that fit into this industrial kind of um never metal but like heavy rock sound that I had to sort of figure out how was I gonna you know wiggle one of my songs into that <laughs> into the space and it was a, it was it was a fun challenge and and you know I I, I I I still think that stuff came off you know really well I remember the band from back back then and it was really cool going back and, and revisiting some of it because I, I like it more now than I did back then. So it's, it's yeah. <laughs> really cool stuff. And um, I do have some bad news because I did discover that in 1999, while en route to a show in Antarctica, um, Skeleton Key were involved in a fatal plane crash. Uh, apparently, Eric was forced to eat you and Rick Lee. And he said, <laughs> you were okay, but Rick was a little gamey. So, so just to update you, I know it's been a few years now, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I blacked it out. <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember that. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, re- I repressed it. So yeah. All right. So, how did you start getting into doing music for TV? Was that a- after Skeleton Key, or did it- was that start occurring? Yeah, during it. That was after. Um, we had done a, a pretty amazing. Um, remix record off the first skeleton key record um it's fantastic spikes through balloon uh we capital allowed us to spend some money hiring a bunch of really interesting people to do remixes for oh, our yeah. for the record i i would urge you know if anybody's out there was is a you know a skeleton key fan it's, it's just try to track down the remixes because there was uh, Dan the Automator, um, T Ray from Cypress Hill. Oh, cool. Um, DJ Spooky, um, Christian Marclay, who's just like an insane, um, incredible uh, turntablist uh, artist. Um, just a lot of uh, very, very interesting remixes uh, from that record. I, I, not a, it, it's a shame that that didn't get more attention because it was a very very cool thing but um one of the remixes uh we let a friend do one um just sort of as a freebie he didn't ask for any money he was just, just like well we don't have any money we've spent it all but if you want to just try one go ahead and try one right and he did it and it turned out to be the best remix of the whole thing and we mm. were all kind of shocked and stunned and he was a he was a a friend of all of ours uh or mine and steve calhoun's the drummer who's steve was from denton texas and and he had been in a band called brave or he'd been in a band called little jack melody and friends with uh this band brave combo who this person phil hernandez had played with and so we were phil had moved to new york from texas and we all knew each other and and when I heard what Phil had done, I was so impressed with 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 his remix that I just had an epiphany that I was just like, I don't I don't think I want to be in a rock band doing this. I think I would rather be doing this other crazy weird thing. And this is I got to think this is like 1998 uh, maybe. Okay, so before um, you were, you died and were eaten. Before I was, before I died and was eaten, yeah. Okay. And he, around that time, um, there was so much cool stuff going on. It was like post post Beasties, uh, Dust Brothers, kind of world where you know Beck was making, you know, it was Odile and um, sampling had kind of moved from, you know, uh, the hip hop world into this other kind of like crazy you know, art world, you know, these bands that we hung out with and people that we knew and friends with like Chibamato, you know, you go see them and you're, uh, and soul coughing is another example. We played those guys. So we, we, we would go see like soul coughing and we even, you know, open for those guys and, you know, um, Mark, the samplist and it was just doing incredible stuff. That just seemed like a completely new, interesting, weird thing. And I, I wanted to jump on that, and and I told Phil, I said, you know, I'm, I'm 
I think I'm done playing, you know, in this loud rock band. I think I want to, I want to do some other weird stuff. And, <laughs> and, um, we, and this was also at the very same time of the home recording, uh, kind of revolution, uh, where up to that point, Pro Tools was just unaffordable, uh, for, for most musicians. And suddenly there were, there were these, you know, audio interfaces you could buy and you could hook up a computer to it. And that's what I did. And I got that and we started, we started doing remixes and producing, uh, uh, bands on the Lower East Side. And, and then out of that, we, we, you know, just as a necessity to survive, um, we we kind of migrated our whole thing into you know film and TV and then I then then we've, we've we're still doing that and and, and you know it's it's Man. been great. So how did how do you get that connected? Do you just submit things to representatives and say hey here's a thirty second clip here's see if yeah, you can fit know, with anything? You no. Know, you know, it's that. That's what's that's what's kind of great. Be I feel like a little bit like Zelig. You know, like I was kind of at the beginnings of a lot of different <laughs> things. You know, like a, um, and I was at the beginning of that little revolution. And that, and you could, you could just literally just make a, a, uh, you know, burn a CD of a bunch of. We we would get so crazy high and just make the weirdest sounds. <laughs> Uh, literally for five days a week for like six or seven hours, we just sit in a room and just like, uh, nobody was, pay- we didn't have jobs and we were just like <laughs> making weird sounds. I don't know how he was surviving. I was still getting like a little bit of money to live on through skeleton key and just sort of making this weird stuff. And, and we, you know, you'd send it out and give it to, um, uh, you know, a few music houses and, um, it, it just was an innocent point like where it hadn't flooded yet with not everybody had a laptop with reason on it or, um, and it was really early, early days for that. So what we were making was so weird and baffling to these people. They were just like, I think they understood that that's where everything was going. And we were kind of already there a little bit and, they wanted a little bit of, uh, of that thing. And that's kind of what, how we did it. We just, you know, basically sent out, you know, little CDs to a bunch of people. And, and, um, uh, and fortunately we, we, we still retained our connections to the friends and the, and the people we still worked as artists and thought of ourselves as artists, not capital A, but you know, little A, just just <laughs> doing the, just wanting to make cool shit. You know, we weren't yeah. real interested in like you know getting rich making doing commercial music or working for film and TV. Uh, we just saw it as a way to like you know supplement this other cool stuff we were doing, and okay. you know we um, and we continued to do that. And I think that having that sort of um, as being a part of our MO really did help our development and our, uh, evolution because we, because of that, I think we ended up finding some really cool people to work with. And, uh, and Bob's burgers was probably, you know, the end result of that. We also did one of my favorites that I've been listening to for years, which is uh, Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations. Mm. That that is such a cool intro. It's just it's so simple, but it's it's so noisy, and I love it. No reservations. Oh yeah, that was so cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had, we we got to bring in John Spencer's Blues Explosion for that, and then oh awesome. Uh, they were in. Australia, I think, and we got and we call and we somehow got a hold of them. We're like, we, hey, we you know, Bourdain wants us to do the, a theme song 
uh, and you guys, can you guys do something and then we'll, we'll, we'll cut it up and, 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 and make something cool with it. And they, they did, they, they recorded, they, they wrote the song and sent it to us. And then we, we did some production and that's definitely a fun little moment. And then did a bunch of that score awesome. for him. Well, and then I got to go, he, t- he took us all out to dinner and to lay all and oh, wow. uh, with the blues explosion and, and, and we got plowed at, at, at lay all. And that, that was, <laughs> that was a fun, uh, that was a fun night. Oh, bet man, hanging out with Blue Explosion and Anthony Bourdain. That must have been insane. Yeah, it was fun. Oh my I, gosh. So I think I, at the very end of the night, I think I fell into a bag of garbage on the street <laughs> and then they had to like pull me out of it. I think that was that's the last thing I remember. <laughs> so uh, when did the the desire to start writing more normal music come back to you? You know, I, it's, yeah, so the, that that's a pretty wild progression uh you know from where i started with from the gun bunnies um in, in the late in the late 80s and then going through skeleton key and then going through all this sort of sampling and and beat making and and then i uh, i moved to woodstock and and i bought a house in 2000 and moved here and to woodstock and uh somewhere along the way i I bought a, an acoustic guitar and I remembered that, oh yeah, I really like to write songs, you know, uh, <laughs> these little ditties. And I started, you know, it was around the time my son was born and I, I, and I just, I think I just, you know, spent a lot of time just, you know, finger picking and, and, and suddenly songs started appearing and, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was really kind of, a, a revelation for me and I was like oh yeah right I need to go back to this and and I've got stories to tell and you know I so I started digging down and started pulling these things out and 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 I realized I was making a record and before I knew it Arkansas Summer my first record was was done and um and and then I and then I you know then I started on this new one and and, and that which has just gotten finished yeah, and, and so you obviously you still have more stories to tell. And one of the interesting things that I've discovered in, in listening to both of them is more so on Arkansas Summer, but even even on the, the new uh, album, the uh, you use some audio clips that sound like there's some old vintage clips. Um, yeah, my family, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, um, where did you find it? Is that actual vintage audio from, from uh it's a uh, it's voicemails from back when we had like actual voicemail technology <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean like 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 cassette like like a vo- an answering machine and I, I i would get these calls from my family or uh and i would uh i would just sort of keep those things around uh the some of the some of the ones uh that i use there's one particular tape that's really interesting that that was recorded in in the 70s and my aunt interviewed my grandfather and my grandmother i think she probably had one of these like cosmopolitan 1970s like self-help things of like interview your parents here's 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 uh, 20 questions to ask your parents or or something <laughs> Uh, that's what she told me at least. And then, so she, uh, she recorded her, uh, my, my grandfather's from Beirut, Lebanon and, and he had, you know, he's broken English and, you know, he's uh, culturally just very, uh, uh, very alien to, to, um, the South, especially where, where we grew up. Right. Yeah. And, um, and she, and my grandmother was also very, uh, uh, she was she was also culturally, you know, challenged in that she was real, from a very, very small town in Arkansas called Wonderview and on a farm with like 13 brothers and sisters and uh, and had or 12. I can't remember exactly. And, and you know, so she my anyway, my aunt, who was, you know, had gr- grown up in you know, a flower child in the 60s and was asking them these questions and she made this cassette tape and somehow I ended up with that cassette and it's just always, it's a little bit of a gold mine for just hearing them respond to these. 
So I used it on the first record and I used it on the second record too. Yeah, and, and it's 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 really cool. I really like those little little vignettes of of the family. I mean, it, it's really personal. What is now? What the the actual the song KJ Jamel? What is what is going on in that? Yeah, so she, she's asked him to sing a song and um, and he, uh, sing a song, you know, she's like, sing a song like you used to sing when we were kids, uh, like from the old country. Okay. And, and so he starts singing this, um, it, it was a, uh, a Lebanese folk song. I think it was a fairly popular song. Uh, we uh, can't remember the name of it, but it was. Uh, so yeah, he was just he. I guess he he. I grew up hearing him sing and play flute a little bit, and that's yeah. That's basically what that was. He he just took off singing on that. Okay, okay. Now, learning a little bit of the backstory of some of these songs, it's. I honestly, I don't really know how you wrote some of these songs because some of them are about some really tragic incidents like uh walking through water and mm-hmm. cause and effect and mm-hmm. it's I, I i don't i i admire how you're able to take what happened in those songs and, and turn it not only turn it into songs but know that you're going to have to talk about it later or mm-hmm. you know, sing the songs in front of people I and mean, that's that to me is incredibly brave and i don't i i i don't know that i could do something like that the song walking through water is about your brother who recently passed away right and, yeah and cause and effect is about a car accident you were in uh in which one of your best friends passed away yeah yeah so was it difficult with so much time passing with the the car accident and your brother passed away f- pretty recently so yeah the well my the the the, the cause and effect, the one that where my friend Wade uh, was died in the car wreck that I was in the car with him, he um, that would happen so long ago, and I had often thought about that, and and you know it was it was nothing there was nothing there for me to to that I could uh, that I could really write about it 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 was too forever it just seemed like impossible to write about that right um and when i was working on this record and i started writing things down i I took a writing class where i was not not writing songs but just just doing some writing okay and and that sort of opened up that a little bit and allowed me to kind of that's that's that song is is written I, i wanted to write it as in, like almost like factual, just as write as many just facts down as I, facts as I possibly could. Not not get too sentimental about any of it. Just let it, you know, uh, talk about what the actual day looked like to me in terms of, uh, up till that moment. And as we lost control, and I was reaching. For the door As it began to fall No, I can't explain Change it all, correct What was lost As we got told uh, you know, and it's been a really long time. It's you know that record was eighty one or eighty two when that happened. So, um, you know, enough time has gone by. With with walking through the water, that song, um, I actually wrote that song before my brother passed away, uh, and he was still going in and out of rehabs at that point, and that's kind of what that song was about. And then before the record came out he he um he passed away before the before that i didn't actually finish the song until after he was gone but um it did it 
um, I doubt I would have probably have written that song after that. Um, that that song is probably not written yet, uh, and it'll be something I, I I think about for a really long time. But um, yeah, that that song that I did write was actually written during that process of of watching him kind of go in and out of rehabs and and struggling with addiction and. All hearts break, all hands wave goodbye. A merry go round, you slow it down, give it one more try. You give up, go down like a water. We keep walking. And uh, it was almost written more for my mother in, in some ways because. Uh, she was his biggest advocate to try to help him get through stuff and so well that's that's one of my favorite songs on the album and the the music is so beautifully arranged uh, and you've got things like the song wasn't concerned you, you've got gorgeous strings on that and then there's a peter frampton comes back and does a, a voice box guitar solo on it it, it <laughs> just comes out, out of nowhere it's amazing i loved it <laughs> Yeah, I, my 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 joke uh, to 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 everybody is that I is like if you want to have a hit song, put a talk box on it. That's yeah. that's how you have a hit song. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, the the only my only familiarity with talk boxes is basically your hit songs. It's like you know it was uh you know tell me something good by Shaka Khan yeah. or you know do you feel like we do Peter Frampton that one Bon Jovi song whatever the There's one. That- a, there's there's a Bon Jovi song with a talk box in it. Yeah, um, living on a prayer I think has it, doesn't it? That's got a talk box in it. Yeah, I think Richie Sambora has got the the. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. 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 Want a hit song? Put a talk box on it. That you, you just uh, broken the code. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I broke something besides the code. With that. I, think, I don't. I don't. I don't think. I don't think this is the next. Uh, do you feel like we do? But maybe I uh, should do this entire show with a talk box. Yeah, <laughs> and then I'll get like Joe Rogan numbers. Well, I got that talk box because we were doing an episode of Bob's Burgers, and they wanted uh, Doctor Yap. Uh, apparently, plays a talk box, and they were like, uh, "Do you guys have a talk box?" And I was like. I, at that point, I didn't have a talk box. I was like, if you're giving me an excuse to go out and buy a talk box, <laughs> say no more. I'm, I'm on it. Yeah. And, uh, I immediately got a talk box, and, and then that was that. <laughs> well, I bet it's so cool because it, it's, I'm hearing these beautiful strings, and then all of a sudden the talk box comes in on it. It was just really awesome. And that's one of the awesome things about this whole album is that you've got these great, beautiful arrangements. And like, they're, they're like, George Martin-esque arrangements and then this incredible guitar solo this wild fuzzed out guitar comes in and plays this amazing solo and then it just goes back no, to this thanks. beautiful song no it's, thanks but what I really really love about it is that the songs are stories it's not um, and I hate to use the word you know throwaway lyrics or anything like that but it's not it's not a typical pop song it's not it's more along the lines of what uh, like a Springsteen or Neil Young would do, where they tell a story. And it's to me, it sounds kind of like you take the Stray Gators and you mix in some Crazy Horse, and then you, <laughs> you've got your album. So maybe you're like 77 Neil Young, where he had the Santa Monica Flyers with Nils Lofgren. Maybe that's what yeah. I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that... Uh, that song started out as a is kind of a of a, like a, a song inspired by the Great American Songbook, you know, like a Cole Porter kind of thing. And I'd I'd written it for my wife and as sort of a just a personal thing. And and and, and but it's dark because it's it's basically. I don't. The, the song doesn't doesn't talk about zombies, but uh, in my mind, while I'm singing it, there's I'm surrounded by zombies, <laughs> and uh, and so you know oh, you would never know that unless I told you. But that that's exactly I, I just envisioning a world like um, 
uh, kind of like zombie uh, zombie land a little bit in Woody Harrelson is like you know you're you're singing a love song but at the same time you're just basically running from like the apocalypse is just like hot on your heels well now that's what's going to be in my head every time I hear that song <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I mean, that's awesome. I love it. Now, are you planning on playing live or touring to support the album at all? Um, a little bit. I'll do. I'm going to do some regional stuff. I'm going to. Uh, uh, I've got shows around here uh, in uh, the Northeast and Boston, and uh, I'll probably play Providence and, and of course New York City and and locally where I live, and then I'll. Um, I'm looking to play down. I got a show in Arkansas and um, I'll hit some of the places like Memphis and maybe Nashville. Oh, cool. And so, you know, do some, I'll do some regional stuff. I won't do a lot. I might go out to LA if I do some, if I do some work out there uh, and, and do a few shows out there, but, um, but that's, you know, not extensive. Well, where can people find the album? Uh, how can they order it? At, uh, and uh, find the out what you on yeah, it's on maxrecordings.com and you can you can go to uh, uh, the label that I'm on and uh, which is based out of Arkansas and buy directly from there or you can go to iTunes or you can listen to it on Spotify or uh, the vinyl is coming out um, next month and uh, we're taking pre-orders now so people can pre-order the record and uh, get a down code, a download code immediately, and then um, and then get uh, a nice little black, round, shiny disc. That's and awesome. It's really, I have to say, it's worth it's worth it. A, a wonderful writer, Janet Steen, wrote some liner notes. I wanted to have an old school record where you could sit down, put the record on, hold the record cover, and actually read something for like ten minutes. Thank you. So, so it's. Uh, I think that's very, very much lost. And, and, and also all the lyrics on the inside of the record, if you buy the vinyl, and it talks about all the players it played on. And I have some amazing players, people like Cindy Cashdollar and Amy Helm and Zach Janikian and Jesse Murphy and Aaron Johnson and Jeff Lipstein. I've just, and, Rachel Yamagata, and, who I love. Rachel Yamagata, yeah. Uh, 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 a, a lot of uh, wonderful people. Mark Sedgwick just – great players uh that i'm just super lucky to to live in a place um like where where i do where you know there's just so many of those great players that they tend to congregate in woodstock don't they that tends to be like a a magnet for for some great musicians yeah 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 the uh you uh you really you you can't swing a dead cat and not hit a uh hit, hit an awesome uh, world-class musician in this town now are you on any uh, uh the social media sites where people can follow you uh yeah goat house studio is uh my instagram and um you know just chris maxwell i think it's chris maxwell songs is my facebook page okay yeah. So yeah, and you know, I think awesome. Chris A. Maxwell is my Twitter uh, thing. I, I never really do that, but I, I think I feed my Twitter by t basically doing an Instagram post and then shooting it out to everything else. So, yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's all a very foreign thing to me, but uh, but it, it, you know, I live in the woods, so it, it kind of helps for me to stay in touch with people <laughs> and a little bit. So. Well, I used to be a photographer. So I love Instagram. So. I will. Yeah, I will check you out on Instagram. Uh, I'll give yeah. you a follow this evening. Oh, cool! Yeah. So yeah, uh, I, used to, I used to play DC when Skeleton he played a lot, like uh, Black Cat and yeah, the nine thirty, uh, nine thirty, and yeah, we uh, Girls Against Boys and Prime. I mean, uh, Helmet and oh yeah, uh, the Melvins and oh. uh God, I mean, we played with so many, so many awesome bands. Brainiac, Shudder to Think. Um, See, and you're 
torn right in, in the heyday for me anyway, like the, the mid nineties. I mean, I, that was, that's, that was insane. We did the last tour with, with Brainiac, Brainiac and Shudder to Think. Oh, oh man. I love so, Shudder to Think. Shudder to Think is awesome. Yeah. I'm not too familiar with Brainiac. I'll have to check that out. Check it out. That there's just a documentary just came out on them. Oh really? Uh, that's, yeah. That's, it's pretty mind blowing. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Really great. Well, man, thank you so much for spending the evening with me. I, I've kept you for a little over an hour now, so yeah, I will let you go you. And, and have the rest of your evening. Thank you so much for your time. Man. I, I've but been great getting to know you. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Mark, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. This is how the sun turns blue And you feel the ground beneath you roll like a wave of heartbreak in your soul you desperate nothing to do this is how the song turns blue and it flows through everything a thunder and a whispering tingle in brackish green I make my own color scheme so I can keep my heart